Well, if you weren't here for the opening, let me just reintroduce myself. If we haven't met, my name's Gene. I'm part of the team here at Restore. And um, I love these uh, moments when uh, skilled musicians, skilled vocalists, uh, skilled people in the tech booth can create moments for us to engage with the worship of Jesus. I'm just so grateful, grateful for this team and grateful for the ways in which uh, we invite uh, God to speak to us every time we gather. Uh, Last weekend, uh, Jansen did a masterful job of uh, beginning this series in the book of Ruth. I'm really uh, proud of, uh, well, the last two weeks. You heard from guys that don't preach all the time. And um, Jansen preached last weekend, the weekend before Chris uh, was teaching. And uh, this both did a phenomenal job. I'm really proud of them. Um, Jansen, basically, he set the stage for uh, these talks from the book of Ruth. And if you're like most of us, we might not have read the book of Ruth real recently. Ruth is a uh, position between uh, Judges and uh, Judges and 1 Samuel, and it's the story. Well, let me, let me just give you a backstory in case you missed it, in case you don't know the story of Ruth. Let me just give you the backstory that we know about so far from uh, our, ser- our series beginning last week. So... Uh, It starts with uh, this family of four, and they live in Bethlehem, that ancient city of Bethlehem. Uh, It is uh, Naomi is the mother's name, Elimelech is the father, and then they have two sons, Malan and Kilion. They're just an ordinary family of four. Think of your family, ordinary family of four. They live in Bethlehem, and as sometimes happens in that ancient world, and even our world today, famine uh, moves into the land. So they are destitute, they are poor, they are looking for, well, they'd like to survive. And so Elimelech looks around and he sees and hears that 50 miles away, about 50 miles away, there's this area called Moab, and he moves his family to Moab. Now, the Moabites live there, Moab Moabites. This was a, uh, a sect of people who the Israelites were forbidden to intermarry with or to associate with. In the Old Testament, we find a lot of that. Uh, and, and the primary reason for this was that um, if you read Genesis 19, uh, this, the Moabite tribe came from an incestuous relationship between Lot and his daughters, out of that relationship was born Moab, out of whose this tribe was named after. They worshipped a foreign god, a, a, a false god, who required evil sacrifices, required child sacrifices. Uh, in the Psalms, uh, the psalmist writer writes that God says that the Moabites are his wash basin. So like a very, uh, uh, he would wash his feet in them, you know? So, so it's a very negative connotation on these people. But in order to save his family, he makes the decision. Elimelech makes the decision to move him, uh, move them to Moab. And there, his sons marry Moabite girls. And we don't know all the circumstances surrounding that, but at some point, the dad and the sons die, leaving Naomi with her two daughters-in-laws. So they have to make a decision. Naomi has to make a decision. And she decides that Bethlehem is where she needs to go back to. And so she gathers her two daughters-in-laws and she blesses them. And she says, now go to your mother's homes. And uh, Orpah does just that. She was married to uh, one of the boys. But Ruth says she won't do that. She clung to Naomi. She had come to love Naomi. She says, don't ask me to leave you and turn back. Wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you live, I will live. Your people will be my people and your God will be my God. Wherever you die, I will die and there I will be buried. May the Lord punish me severely if I allow anything but death to separate us. And when Naomi saw this, she relented. So Naomi and Ruth, they make their way back to Bethlehem. They're homeless. 
They are hopeless. They're hurting. And they have no husbands. In that ancient culture, no husband equals destitution and poverty. And in their singleness, it meant that their options in that culture were extremely limited. Unless, of course, a hero walks through the door. Last week, Jansen pointed to rom-com videos, romantic comedy videos. I'm kind of looking at this and saying, well, I think it's more like a rom-drama, a romantic drama. Enter Boaz. Boaz walks through the door, but I'm getting ahead of myself. By the way, speaking of singleness, when I was single, there were a multitude of ways to, uh, you know, connect with people, connect with girls, to find people that I wanted to be with. Today, like, where do you, if you're single, like, where do you go? Who do you find? How do you find them? We know that the average age of marriage is way higher than it used to, older than it used to be. And today, half of all adults, nearly half of all adults, get this, are unmarried. And U.S. marriage rates have dropped by almost 60% since the 1970s. So we've been on a trajectory for a long time where marriage is viewed very differently than in the past. But still, we humans, we're built for connection. We're built for relationship. We want this and we need uh, each other. We, we desire relationships. This is obvious because many of us are married, but it's also true that we're not always happily married, hence the rate of divorce. So it seems to me that there is a better way than what we're seeing in the culture out there and in here. There's got to be a better way. But where do we look? Where do we find the love that we want? How do I even know what I'm looking for? And if I'm married, how can I make that better? See, some of us this morning need to do what we're about to do, which is turn the page and go to the next chapter. We need to go to the next chapter. Some of us have been wallowing around either in marriages that are ineffective and shallow and, and in trouble, frankly, or we are unmarried, which is fine, and yet we're looking. And so we need to turn the page, go to the next chapter, be willing to step into that next chapter. And this is where we pick it up in Ruth chapter two. We're, we're turning the page from chapter one to chapter two, and here's where we read. The story continues. Now there was a wealthy and influential man in Bethlehem named Boaz, who was a relative of Naomi's husband, Elimelech. Now, this translation, the New Living Translation of the Scripture says there was a wealthy, they call him a wealthy and influential man. If you look in, the, in, in other translations, it might say a man of standing. A man of standing simply means he was wealthy, he had influence, he had position, he was a man that knew who he was, he walked into the room, people knew who he was, he brought influence, he brought a positive influence into the spaces that he walked into. This was Boaz. He was a man of standing, much better than a man of sitting. A man of sitting might be considered just complacent, not a man of action. Boaz was a man of action. He was not the man of sitting. Uh, you don't know how long I've waited to say this. Women, ladies, while you wait on Boaz, when, while you wait on your Boaz, say Boaz with me. Boaz. Say it again. Boaz. Don't settle for any of his relatives. Lazy as, broke as, and especially his third cousin, cheap as. <laughs> Stay away from them. Wait on your Boaz. One day, <laughs> Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi, hey, let me go out into the harvest fields to pick up the stalks of grain left behind by anyone who is kind enough to let me do it. Naomi replied, all right, my daughter, go ahead. So Ruth went out to gather grain behind the harvesters. Now, some translations again will say gleaning. 
She went out to glean. What does glean mean? Glean basically points to a tradition or a commandment, actually, that God gave the Israelites. In Leviticus 19, in the Old Testament, he uh, instructed them to not harvest the edges or pick up what was dropped in their harvesting, just to leave it on the ground and, uh, and, inst- and, and allow those who were not able to harvest their own fields, those that were poor or destitute, to come along behind the harvesters and pick up what was left over. It's kind of like God's soup kitchen, right? It's kind of like a, a food bank in that ancient world. We continue, and as it happened, she found herself, Ruth found herself working in a field that belonged to Boaz, the relative of her father-in-law, Elimelech. I want us to see the words, as it happened. As it happened. Why as it happened? Why did it, why did it just so happen? Well, if we remember in chapter one, Naomi prayed and she asked God, she said, May the, she, she, she asked God to show his kindness to Ruth and to bring her another husband. And again, I'm getting ahead of the story a little bit, but I want you to see that just so happens is not a just so happens. See, God can work in the We often like, give me the supernatural. Let me see the miracle. And I'm telling you this morning, God just so happens to use the natural world to bring about his supernatural intentions. Sometimes it simply means that we need to lift our eyes. We need to see what's happening around us. Paul, the Apostle Paul, in the book of Romans in the New Testament, writes in chapter 8, he says, God causes everything to work together for good. This is a prime example of God saying, I'm going to work this out. Ruth is destitute. She's poor. Naomi, she's from Bethlehem. I'm going to move them back. They decide to move back. And Ruth works. It's a natural thing that she's doing. It just so happens that in the day-to-day work that she's doing, God shows up and he moves in her life. Because when you pray, God listens. Do you believe that? When we pray, God hears us. God tunes into us. He just so happens to show up. That's why it's so significant for us to be praying for our future spouses, for our children, for our children's spouses. Ruth is working. She's just doing the normal stuff, and God shows up. While she was there, Boaz arrived from Bethlehem and greeted the harvesters. First thing he says is, the Lord be with you. The Lord bless you, the harvesters replied. Now, don't you want to follow somebody like Boaz? Don't you want to be in his employ? Don't you want to be in the room with him? The first thing he does is bless the people that are working for him. He is kind. He is positive. He mentions God. First thing, the Lord bless you. Look, if you are seeing someone, if you are uh, talking to someone, if they're a potential husband or wife for you and you don't hear about God until sometime maybe the 10th interaction you have with them, or maybe you never hear about it, if God is not spoken early on, if God is not spoken about early on, beware, beware. When something is super important to us, when we can't imagine our lives being lived any other way than with the, 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 the Holy Spirit's guidance in our lives, then it ought to be on the tip of our tongue when we begin to relate to people. And we don't have to be weird to do it. You can, you can talk about Jesus without being a weirdo, right? So don't be afraid of that. I talk with people all the time, single people all the time. Hey, I had a date last night. You did? How'd it go? Is she a follower of Jesus? I don't know. Haven't asked yet. Problem. Big red flag. The other thing I want to point out is that Boaz was a businessman. Boaz was not a priest. He was not a prophet. He wasn't a pastor. He wasn't wasn't waiting to engage his ministry until he was in a position in a church. No. No. 
right where he was. He was leading well. He was leading with kindness and positivity. He was speaking blessing over the people that worked for him. He was speaking blessing over the community as he did his work. As he went about his work, he engaged the living God in everything that he did. He was in ministry, but his ministry just so happened not to be a professional ministry, but it was a ministry right where he was conducting business in his community. Some of you are waiting for placement. Would you consider that you've been placed? Would you consider that the very place you are at is the place that God has called you to serve and to minister? Don't wait anymore. The waiting's over. You're turning the chapter. You're going to the next chapter. If you're sitting here this morning and you've got a mindset that says, well, maybe someday I'm going to do what God's calling me to do, turn the chapter, turn to the next chapter, go there, turn that page, and don't go back there anymore because God has placed you right where you are for the purposes, his purposes in your life and in the life of the people that you influence. Then Boaz, verse 5, Boaz asked his foreman, who is that young woman over there? Who does she belong to? He notices Ruth. And the foreman replied, She's a young woman from Moab who came back with Naomi. She asked me this morning if she could gather grain behind the harvesters, and she's been hard at work ever since, except for a few minutes rest in the shelter. So in the natural occurrence of life, Boaz just so happens to notice Ruth. Now, if Ruth was here this morning, quite candidly, her online profile could be problematic. I mean, she's a Moabite. She was the wrong person from the wrong people. These were, this was an Israelite community she was in. She was a Moabite, not so much. Kamash was the wrong God. That was the God that she served prior to coming along with, um, with Naomi. It was the wrong God, false God, demon God, required evil sacrifices. We're not doing so well yet. She was widowed, which means she was homeless. She was destitute. She was not a virgin. Ruth, you might say, has a complicated past. But she turned to the next chapter. And she said, I'm not going to stop that from keeping me stepping in and claiming my future. Ruth is taking the risk. She's working hard. She's persistent. She's not giving up. Somebody here this morning, like, needs the encouragement. Don't give up. Don't let your past complicate your future. Boaz went over and said to Ruth, listen, my daughter, stay right here. It's kind of weird he calls her daughter. Listen, my daughter, stay, with here, with, stay right here with us when you gather grain. Don't go to any other fields. So he's saying, like, hang tight with us. Stay right behind the young women working in my field. See which part of the field they are harvesting and then follow them. And I've warned the young men not to treat you roughly. And when you are thirsty, help yourself to the water they've drawn from the well. Boaz has showed up. Boaz showed up in this moment. You want to know what to look for in a guy? Look for, look for one who honors. He honors her. He honors Ruth. Look for somebody that will open the door for you. That will let you go first. Boaz protects her. He protects her. He protects her from other men. When he says, I've warned the young men not to treat you roughly, he's probably indicating that it's a dangerous space for women to be. And they could be sexually harassed in those moments of working in the field. So he's protecting her, protecting her heart. He's protecting her purity. He's providing for her. He's saying, hey, follow my harvesters. Stay here. Glean from my fields. He's providing for her. Look for the guy that's going to pick up the check and be generous to you. And he prays for her. If you've got a guy in your life, ladies, who thinks marriage is optional, and if he can't pray with you, it's major flags. 
Look for these qualities in the guys you connect with, the people you connect with. And guys, let's develop this. These are qualities that we ought to be developing in our lives. In verse 10, Ruth fell at his feet and thanked him warmly. What have I done to deserve such kindness, she asked. I am only a foreigner. Yes, I know, Boaz replied. But I also know about everything you've done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband. I have heard how you left your father and mother and your own land to live here among complete strangers. May the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge, reward you fully for what you've done. See, he sees her. He sees her in that moment. Often our attempt to um, find love is complicated and often it's misguided. So what are the qualities and standards that you have set up for yourself and for those you connect with? Here, Boaz sees Ruth and she, he sees that she's faithful to God. She has left the false God of Chemosh and has attached herself to the true God of Israel. She's loyal to her family. He sees her as a loyal person. She stayed with Naomi throughout that transition. She's a hard worker. Naomi didn't have to implore her to go get grain. She went and got it. She took initiative. And she honors God morally. In that culture and in that day, widows were mostly forced into prostitution. Ruth didn't do that. Verse 13, I hope I continue to please you, sir, she replied. You have comforted, comforted me by speaking so kindly to me, even though I am not one of your workers. At mealtime, Boaz called to her, come over here and help yourself to some food. You can dip your bread in the sour wine. And so she sat with his harvesters and Boaz gave her some roasted grain to eat. She ate all she wanted and still had some left over. She ate. Not only did she eat, but she had leftovers. See, this is the constant and consistent work of God. He doesn't just give us a little bit. He gives us with abundance. He does exceedingly more than we can ever ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us, his people. What you want is you want someone that doesn't just meet the needs you have, but exceeds your expectations by blessing you with the blessings from God in heaven and loving you in a way that honors God and help you feel secure in all that you do. So what are you looking for this morning? Where are you looking for it? Are you looking in Moab or are you looking in Bethlehem? So we need to turn the page. We need to go to the next chapter. It doesn't matter if you're hurting or stuck in your life this morning, you gotta turn the page. If you are uh, struggling with addiction, submitting to anxiety, if you are hopeless this morning, turn the page, go to the next chapter. Whatever it is you're going through today, I know that God hears your prayers because when you pray, it just so happens that God shows up. Supernatural miracles are definitely a thing that God does. But what if the miracle this morning is that you show up in the way that only you can, that you bring your very best self to the table that you pull your chair up to, that proverbial table which God invites us to, because God can and will use the natural world, your natural skills and abilities to bring his supernatural intentions to work for you. Go to the next chapter. When you turn away from your Moab, you'll find blessing in Bethlehem. Naomi made a decision. And then Ruth chose, and together they moved from what had been to what would be. God uses times of turning the page, stepping into the next chapter, times of transition to expose where our loyalties lie. What am I attached to? Where do my affections lie? Are they connected to the past or the present? Or will I trust God with the future he's calling me to? Because when we live by faith, we don't jump ship just because the chapter got bad. 
Let me say that again. When we, when we, when we live by faith, we don't jump ship just because the chapter got bad. Now, if you've lived long enough, you know that it's not all blue skies and sunshine. We lose jobs. We go through divorce. We lose to death. Life is hard. But we live in the long arc of faithfulness that says that despite our circumstances, we will bring glory and honor to our Redeemer, Jesus Christ. That's the bottom line for us. As followers of the way of Jesus, we don't just step out when things get rough, when things get difficult, because they will. This is real life, friends. Real life. And real life demands that we step in when others would step out. Because that is the way of Jesus. Would you stand with me? So I often ask God what he would want to say to the gathered congregation. What is it that he would want to say? I, th I believe this word this morning is one that he would want us to communicate. I wouldn't communicate it if I didn't believe that this was a word for us. And what I believe this morning is that some of us are on the precipice of the next chapter. But what's required is that we turn the page and we actually are willing to step into the next chapter. And we turn the page not because life is difficult, but because we believe God is calling us to whatever that next is. The problem that happens is that we are only partially committed. We are only partially committed. And when we are only halfway there, if we're not fully in, that's the result we're going to get. We only get partial results. Some of us need to turn the page and say, I didn't used to follow Jesus, but today I'm choosing to say yes to the way of Jesus. And what does that mean? What does that mean for us? I don't always know what happens in the room. And we have this very simple five-word phrase that we often use where we say, Jesus, I give you my life. Jesus, I give you my life. And I need you to know that that's a short sentence. It's a short phrase. But you have many more conversations with God. But that's where it starts. A couple weeks ago, like some guy sitting in the back of the room, and I find out this week that he said those five words. He stepped into a relationship with Jesus just by saying those five words. It sounds too simple, doesn't it? To have your trajectory changed, to have your soul and mind and body restored to wholeness, it sounds too simple, doesn't it? It's not. <laughs> it's not simple. That first step is. But the life of following the way of Jesus, don't hear me say it's simple. It is hard. It is not the easy way. And so just know that this morning, I'm again inviting you, if you have not said yes to Jesus, or if you know you need to turn the page, go to the next chapter, and you have not said, Jesus, I give you my life, if you've not made that commitment, and I'm inviting you to do that again this morning. So as we pray, would you just hold your hands out like this? We talk about this as an act of surrender, just to say, all right, holding my hands out in front of me, this is just a visible representation of my surrendering And if you've never said, I want to follow Jesus because I believe that that's my next chapter, then I'm inviting you this morning to simply say, Jesus, I give you my life. Jesus, I give you my life. I'm going to turn the page. I'm going to go to the next chapter. I'm not going to be attached to my past or my present, but I am looking to the future for a new way of living, for a new trajectory. 
Jesus, I give you my life. Father, in the name of Jesus, for those who have said that this morning for the very first time, or if they're re-engaging after having been in that last chapter way too long, would you strengthen them? Would you give them courage? Would you place your uh, peace and grace all over them? Because God, we know that uh, when we follow you, uh, you don't typically remove all the hard things, but you give us what we need to enter into those difficult things. To experience victory, to experience love and grace like never before. So Father, we thank you that you are the one who has sent Jesus to take on flesh and blood, to walk among us, to die, and to rise again as our living Savior. We receive that grace this morning. In Jesus' name, amen.